A big warm welcome to the Two Simon Show number five, where we're going to be fighting the Battle of Watling Street in 61 CE, where Boudicca rattled the Romans with her rebellion. Enjoy. Welcome again to uh, the Two Simon Show battle number five in the uh, in the history of great battles. Still sticking with our our lovely favourite of Rome for a little while. So uh, it's a good day for from me, and I've got as usual my friend Doctor Simony over there. And it's a good day from him. <laughs> yeah, and oh look, he's he's, we he's wearing a Motorhead T-shirt because actually this battle probably comes closest to overkill than anything I've seen for a long time. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Probably quite good. There we go. There we go. So I will do by means of an introduction, just get us going. Most of this for the history is going to come from Simon. I'm going to chip in with a few thoughts, but this is not what I'm a great expert in, I have to say. Uh, but it is one that Simon is a very great expert in. So um, I think we'll all learn an awful lot as we go through. So this one's got quite a bit of history and quite a few pictures and photographs to tell the story of what happened. Uh, we'll then come back to how we've refought and set up the battles. We've got them set up for you in Maximus form on uh, on. Simon's table. I've got it in Pacto form on my table. It's quite entertaining. On my table, it's all the 14 bases of rock-hard Romans on a hill versus a full 64 bases of, of ancient Britain. So it, it's uh, it's more than four to one in terms of fighting troops, in terms of the numbers. So that's, uh, that's quite something. And uh, Simon's got a sim similar mass of troops to go for. So I won't say a little, a little much at the beginning. I'll just get us going and, and hand over. So let me put the file up with our lovely new format. Let's see. That's the what if. That's the other one. I'll show you the what if at the end. So here we are. Um, we've made it slightly easy to print out for you all when it goes online. So uh, Watling Street was 61 CE. It's the uh, last exciting days of Boudicca. Uh, and if I just pop that over there. Get myself out of the way. I'm in the way at the moment. Maybe pop. And the uh, the rebellion obviously is famous because it started in Essex. So uh, it's it's uh, it's like the uh, the tower <laughs> oh, of the Simon. ancient world. <laughs> oh Simon! Oh Simon! Yes, Norfolk! Nor Norfolk! Norfolk! Oh well, Norfolk. I'll have to do a different accent <laughs> now, Simon. You've been abroad so, too uh, long, mate. So therefore, so by means of introduction, I reckon it's probably the source of that famous sort of saying of Brahmi, there's thousands of them, Sarge. <laughs> so imagine this battle uh, with them all coming up at the, at the, at the beginning. And of course, uh, m and <clears throat> m &Ms means thousands and thousands. There you go. So that's my contribution for the day. <laughs> all over with. And without more ado, I shall pass on to Dr. Elliot, who will be a little bit more serious about the topic of Boudicca, starting with the most magnificent statue that we have in the UK. Actually, it's, it's, it's outside Port Cullis House, where, uh, where most of the government offices are these days. Over to you, Sam. Which is a very interesting place to put it, because it, it's the, it, it could easily remind all the politicians there what might happen to them if they get too avaricious or, um, or, or overbearing. The point of that image, actually, Simon, is because uh, it, it's designed to show how iconic a figure... Boudicca is, Simon, I've got some feedback coming from you, by the way. It's designed Can to show you? how iconic a figure Boudicca is in the narrative of British history. It's one of those figures, Boudicca, who, um, when we were being educated in history, um, uh, is one of those individuals who uh, always sort of figures in a, in, in a really impressive way, largely because she gave the Romans a run for the money. And we know most about Boudicca, obviously, through the primary sources, Tacitus, Dio, for example. The thing to remember here is the Romans loved um, a leader who ran them close. So think Hannibal, for example, and they really loved a leader who ran them close who was a woman. So we have Boudicca here, who we have a lot of information about from the primary sources, which enables us, pairing this with the archaeological record and modern interpretations, to present a really interesting sort of narrative about what may really have happened in the Boudican revolt. Uh, and what we're going to do here is actually almost experimental archaeology, because Thank, thanks to Tacitus, we have a very good description of the battle site where guys, uh, Suetonius Paulinus, the British governor, actually defeated Boudicca. And so we've recreated that description in both of our battles, and we're going to run through those a little bit later for you. But in the first instance, what I want to do is give you a bit of background so you can actually understand how the Boudican revolt fits into certainly the wider Principate history of Roman Britain. So next slide, please, Simon. And see, I, just before you do that, just to let everyone I think uh, Richard Jeffrey Cook, our list maestro, has joined us today. He's, he's leaving the meeting. He's on his way into London with a hacksaw to take the sides off the chariot. 
<laughs> Very good. So, firstly, let's look at the uh, the, the, the the tribal geography of uh, Roman Britain uh, from the period broadly between between the the two incursions of Julius Caesar and then the invasion which succeeded in AD 43 of Claudius under the control of Aulus Plautius. The key tribes here for our narrative regarding Boudicca are the Iceni, who were the tribe in the north of North Norfolk, the Trinovantes in eastern Essex, and the Catavalloni broadly in Hertfordshire and the area above uh, Roman London. And let's remember this is very early in the Roman occupation of Britain, so it's something between AD 60 and 61. And remember, Aulus Plautius only invaded in AD 43, so it's only 17, 18 years after the Romans had originally arrived. So let's have a look at what happened in that period before the Boudican Revolt. Next slide, please, Simon. So the Roman conquest of Britain was a very long process. It wasn't like Caesar's conquest of Gaul, which only took about eight years. So therefore, given the sanguinous nature of that conquest, it was fairly easy for the Romans to incorporate uh, Gaul into province provinces of the late Republic and then the uh, Principate Empire. In Britain, it was very different. So in Britain, uh, it took over 60 years to get to a point where Agricola could, in the early 80s, claim to conquer the far north of Britain. So this is a very different story. So firstly, there are a couple of stop lines which are important to understand here as the conquest takes place. So the first key stop line is the stop line at the end of the AD 43 invasion where Plautius defeats the native Britons at the battle of a river crossing battle, which is probably the River Medway, defeats the native Britons crossing over the River Thames, and then uh, gets a, a, a peace agreement with the British tribes agreed uh, heavily in the Romans' favour at Camaludinum, modern Colchester, which becomes the first provincial capital. At that point, Claudius is with him and the province is declared operational. So the first Roman province of Britain was basically the southeast. So you have the initial stop line. But very quickly... Uh, Claudius, before departing after 16 days, orders Plautius to crack on and start expanding the imperial territory controlled by the Romans. So the pr province gets bigger and bigger. And so you have four or five years of campaigning. So you have the famous campaigns of Vespasian in the southwest with Legio II Augusta. You have Legio IX Hispana, the famous Ninth Legion. Um, uh, launching sort of northwards until it founds the legionary fortress in Lincoln. You have Legio 20, Vera Victrix, and Legio 40 in Jemina, going into the uh, Midlands and then latterly the Welsh marches. And the stop line then, and this is very important for this, this, this narrative, is broadly a line from the Severn to the Wash. Uh, it's later called uh, by modern historians the Fossway Frontier, because later it becomes the Fossway, one of the key Roman roads in Britain going from Lincoln down to Exeter. Uh, and so there, the Romans remain until they have a sort of a consolidation phase, until probably, that's great, Simon, thank you, actually, until the later AD 50s, when, again, there's a resurgence as, uh, under Nero in uh, conquering more swathes of Britain and incorporating them into this new province. So then we see the Fossway frontier becoming the line, of, the, the line from which the advance takes place into the north up to Brigantian territory, and certainly, crucially, here into Wales. Now, very important for our story here is that the Fossway Frontier, when it was created, 47-48, included quite a lot of vexillation sized Roman forts, which then became the logistics bases as the Romans expanded out in the later AD 50s. Next slide, please, Simon. So, and I'm going to read this. Uh, because uh, I can't see it very clearly on the screen. So two slides with lots of words on here, and then it all goes back to me talking to pictures. Very pretty pictures, as I'm sure Simon will agree as well. Uh, almost as pretty as this fine book. There we go. I always like to get a plug of that in. Um, so who were the Iceni in North Norfolk? Well, they're, they're a Brythonic tribe speaking a Brythonic native language in northern East Anglia. Um, their, their capital later becomes uh, Venter Isonorum, which is Casus and Tedmans, the, the Kivitatis capital of the Roman province, which we're going to come back to later. Um, they also controlled small parts of Suff Suffolk and Cambridgeshire. Um, the, there were no overt links with this tribe with continental neighbours in the pre-Roman period, unlike, for example, the Parise in the um, in eastern Yorkshire and the Atrobates in the Thames Valley and the Belgae on the south coast. But they did know the Romans, and they're also sophisticated enough to have a coin-based economy before the, the arrival of the Romans. They're one of the 11 tribes who surrender to Claudius at Camaludinum in AD 43. Um, they initially become a client state. Now, this is very important. They become a client state of the Romans. 
being a client state of the Romans was a very common way for the Romans to take their time conquering a, a, an area of territory without wasting the money and the lives needed to actually con conquer land in a militaristic way. And normally what would happen is the leader of the uh, the client um, the client kingdom, let's say, uh, would agree that on their death, in their will, their territory will become part of the Roman Empire, in this case, the province of Britannia. Uh, think of Pergamum, Pergamum, for example, how Pergamum became the Roman province of Asia. It's a very good example or analogy. Um, so what we have here is the Icene with the king by this time, Prasutagus, 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 keep uh, pra practicing how to pronounce that name. Uh, uh, he, he, he's a Roman client uh, king and his kingdom in his will, he writes, is going to become part of the Roman Empire. However, he muddies the water because he also says that his daughters will also inherit the kingdom as well. So it will effectively be shared between Rome and his daughters. And clearly, uh, the Romans aren't interested in that whatsoever. And remember, at this time, the Roman emperor is Nero. So Aulus Plautius, at the point where, uh, sorry, um, uh, Paulinus, the governor, at the point when uh, Prasutagus dies in AD 60-61, cl uh, claims... Uh, the Iceni territory as part of the world of Rome and uh, has troops sent north into North Norfolk to claim this territory, but finds that the will has been written in this very odd way. And therefore, a conflict begins. And we have Tacitus and Dio explaining in different ways how the Boudican revolt begins from this time. So Boudica is clearly the wife of Prasutagus. Remember, by the way, Prasutagus would have been Iceni. Almost certainly Boudica wasn't because it was very unlikely that his queen would come from his own kingdom. There would be no benefit for his own kingdom from, from that being the case. So therefore, she may be a Brigantian. And some historians have said she was actually a Batavi from the Rhine Delta. So you can imagine this sort of foreign um, dialect queen, um, clearly with a huge amount of personality and a huge amount of personal strength and will, deciding to say no to the Romans when the military arrived to claim her territory. And at this point, Tacitus says the Romans flogged her and raped her daughters. Dio, though, is very interesting because he, he takes a different line altogether. He says, in actual fact, the Romans had a very elegant way of pun punishing the Iceni and any other neighbouring tribes who joined her. Because part of the part of the means by which the Romans Romanized uh, uh, the, the new elites in their new provinces was to lend them huge amounts of money so they could build grand public buildings, which is an expression of Romanitas, and they could send their sons certainly to Rome to learn Latin, and they could buy fine togas. So, so what um, Dio says is that the Roman money lenders called their loans in, which bankrupted the aristocracy in Norfolk or the north of Norfolk and I've seen our territory and maybe the neighboring tribes. But whatever the two causes, maybe both are right at the same time, whatever the two causes, the revolt begins. And it's it's incendiary in the extreme. Um, and the point I'll make here is to remember that Paulinus at this time, the governor, isn't in his own province. He's campaigning about as far away in the west as he could be, he's actually in the process of conquering uh, the Isle of Anglesey in northwest Wales. And that's where he receives word that uh, there's been this conflagration taking place in North Norfolk. So next slide, please, Simon. So this is a fantastic map. We've got two maps here, which uh, our friend Nigel Empton uh, has designed for us. And this is the one that I'm going to be using in my Romans, Roman, Romans at War book, which is out of September, because it's such a great map. And everything here... Everything is here to tell you the whole story of the Boudicca Revolt. So first, you can see where the Iceni are in the north of Norfolk. You see the uh, Camaludinum to the south. Remember, we've got the uh, Trinovantes immediately to the south of the Iceni. And then to their southwest, you've got the Catavlorni, the three principal tribes involved. Remember, in the Catavlorni, probably the largest tribe outside of the Brigantes in, 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 in pre-Roman Britain. Um, so... The incendiary rebellion takes place and immediately it sort of uh, brings in all the local people. So clearly everyone's fed up with the world of Rome uh, and they head the, the, the whole party, probably 100,000 strong, head south and they go straight for the provincial capital, Camaludinum, which they and I'll show you this in images later. They sack and they burn uh, and they massacre everybody. One second, Simon. Yeah. So my dad calling. Typically, 
I can't wait to show him the. I can't wait to show him the deck later. If he gets, give me his email address. I'll pop him in. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, hopefully, he won't call again. So therefore, he'll 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 appear he'll appear as a guest guest presenter in the uh, the program with me madly trying to um, cancel his call. So Camelodunum has been torched. Ultimately, at the end of the incendiary rebellion, apparently eighty thousand Romano British are killed. The, uh, at this point, you had the first military confrontation with um, the. Uh, uh, the Romans and the revolt, because the legion that's closest is Legio 9 Hispana, the famous Ninth Legion, later mysteriously disappearing, subject to Rosemary Sutcliffe's book, The Eagle, Eagle of the Ninth. Um, this is based in Lincoln at the time and has vexillations to its south. And the the, 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 the legate in charge of this uh, legion is called Serialis, famously later becomes one of the great warrior um, governors of Britain but at this time he's a failure because he leads vexillations of the ninth and probably vexillations of auxiliaries and auxiliary cavalry to try and intercept Boudicca. Fails to stop her in, uh, fails to stop her in uh, getting to Camelodunum but he does intercept her south of Camelodunum and he loses. He loses so badly in this set piece battle that actually he flees and leads his foot troops to their fate and then goes and hides with his cavalry in a fort nearby for the rest of the revolt a very un-Roman thing to do. So Boudicca then aims for London. London at this point is an emporium, a mercantile place, not the provincial capital yet. It only becomes the provincial capital after the Boudicca revolt. And Boudicca arrives in London. Just before she arrives, Paul Linus has started his advance down Watling Street. So Simon, could you just draw the arrow along the line from Watling Street to so Wales down to London? So it's broadly the line of the A5 and it's this is where we get the name of the Battle of Watling Street, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the primary sources say that Paulinus actually got to London and told the Londoners, I'm not going to fight Boudicca here because I don't think it can hold it because there's no town walls, etc. And he was clearly outnumbered. So he orders them to evacuate. Some do evacuate. In fact, the procurator, who is the number two to the governor in charge of uh, getting all the wealth out of the province for the imperial treasury, has already legged it to France, to Gaul. That's how serious this revolt is already. So some of the Londoners do evacuate and go back with Paulinus, and some don't. I think this is a very unlikely uh, thing to have happened, actually, because even with the speed the Romans could have marched at, they're very unlikely to have got all the way down the A5 to London by that time. I think what Paul Linus had done was sent messengers down to London on his behalf to tell mm. the Londoner, probably fast cavalry column, um, to evacuate. Uh, and those who evacuate do, they go back to Paul Linus. Those who don't get butchered by Boudicca. And London's torched. And then Boudicca realises she needs to have a meeting engagement with the governor because she realises she's on a roll. She thinks she's going to be able to overturn the Roman uh, presence in Britain, maybe defeat the Roman province in Britain altogether once and for all. So what she does is advance along the line of the A5, Watling Street, where she knows through her own intelligence, Paul Linus is coming to try and stop her. So the two forces at this point are roughly about 100,000 to 230,000 um, for Boudicca, I'd estimate what you're looking at there is between 80,000 and 100,000 fighting troops and up to 200, the, the rest of the 230,000 account followers just intent on getting a bit of loot because this is the only opportunity they'll ever get if they're going to kick the Romans out. So, so, so let's get in the mind of Paul Linus now. Paul Linus realises that he's got to defeat this uh, revolt. He realises he's probably faced with odds of 10 to 1, as we'll discuss later, and therefore he needs to choose a battle site he knows he's got a good chance of winning on. And as we'll talk about later, the primary sources are very descriptive. This is Tacitus in his annals, describing the battle site very famously as having a funnel, a wooded flanks and a, a rear. And the, the modern interpretations of this are to suggest a bowl-shaped valley with a funnel entrance. And this would have been along the A5 Watling Street somewhere where mm. He deployed his troops, probably with marching camps at the flanks. We'll go into detail later. So he's in a very secure position, and I'll talk about it later. And Boudicca has got to fight him because she knows that if she keeps on going north west on Watling Street, she'll end up with the Romans in her rear. Uh, so therefore, she'll be vulnerable. So she has to fight him where Paul, Paul Linus chooses. I really think Paul Linus is a bit like Wellington. He knows the battlefield is going to fight in here because he goes thought. all the way... And he goes down to the Fosway frontier where he knows he's got all these logistic bases, the former vexillation forts, and he knows his terrain. And these logistic bases are absolutely rammed with materials to support his campaigning in the northwest in Wales and towards the Brigantes. 
So therefore, that, he's tore, he's tore up. You think about the beginning scene in uh, Gladiator with the bombardment of the uh, Ballista and the Onegas and the Scorpios. Well, this is exactly what's here. I think I think here, and this is represented in my interpretation, there's a much larger proportion of artillery on display for his force here than normally. So so I'll stop there, and I'll just go through a few images for you, Simon. So next one. Just so, just before you do that, a couple of comments. So, so when you're talking about the forts, you're talking about, to be, you're talking about all of this stuff around here, aren't you? This is, this That's is right. If you if you, yeah. if you if you draw a line, start at the uh, starting Gloucester. Gloucester. So head of, he, head of the seven, a bit further there, south. Yeah. south. Bit further and then there, draw, yeah. draw a line up to uh, Kings Lynn on, on the wash. Oh, all the way across. Draw that. Yeah, so over to that. Yeah. yeah. That's the Fosway frontier. That's the stop line. Yeah. And along there, you've got numerous forts, some of which are towns today. Remember, most of the towns and cities like of modern these, Britain yeah. okay. were originally Roman forts. Uh, uh, Legio 9 Hispano had already founded uh, Leicester and Lincoln as part of his expansion. Yes, yeah, yeah. Legio uh, 20 Valeria Victrix had already founded um, uh, founded Manchester as an example. Uh, Legio Torgus had already founded Exeter. But you have this yeah. line, the Fosway Frontier. So, so the narrative there is he's tooled up. So next yeah, image. So he's got a lot of gear around here in this sort of area. So this is a fine place for him to fight. Now I, I tend to agree with you for what I read about. I think it is a lot like Wellington that he knew this area quite well and would find somewhere along this zone where he had a defensible position where he could actually fight the battle. I think that's spot on. It's, worth, it, it's, worth, it's, it's worth saying one last thing before we move on to the images. Even with all, it's, it's a bit like uh, the modern interpretation of people like James Holland of the Battle of Britain. They say, in retrospect, it was a no-brainer that Britain would win the Battle of Britain. It's a different argument entirely, but it's the same kind of debate. Hmm. If you read historical narratives about this battle written today, because of the enormous nature of the Roman victory people say it's a no-brainer but even then Paul Linus had to have been on his a-game on the day to win because of the weight of numbers you know Simon the way we've had to recreate the battle it's very difficult to recreate even for Meg but we've done it mm -hmm. to recreate this weight of numbers in Boudicca's favour as we'll talk about later so next image just what happened to Legia 2 well we're down here well there's a very actually it's a really good point actually Simon so let's let's what we'll do we'll take Paul Linus could you put could you put your arrow on the two for me? Yeah. yeah. Now go on to the Foss Way. Yeah. So we're on here. That's there. Yeah. I keep going northwest. Keep going northeast. Sorry, and and you, yeah. you're there. Stop. 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 Yeah. That's yeah. called High Cross, and that is actually the key transport node in Roman Britain, the High Cross in Leicestershire. That's where the Foss Way meets mm -hmm. Watling Street. Watling Street. Yeah. And there's, and, and there's a very important point to make here. I was going to cover, cover later, but actually it makes more sense. You're right, Simon, to talk about it here. So the legionary deployments we've got are, we know that nine Hispan has been defeated, but vexillations of it which have survived or not fought further north now head towards Plautius and meet him at High Cross. Plautius brings with him the whole of 14 Jemima, Jemima which is an elite fighting legion, and part of 20 Valeria Victrix, which is an also an elite fighting legion. And he also then sends word down to Exeter, where 2 Augusta is based in the new fortress, and says, can you join me, please, because there's a bit of a punch-up going to take place. Now, the legate and the number two in command, the junior senator of 2 Augusta, aren't there. They're actually in Rome. So it's the camp prefect, the number three, who's in charge, and he bottles it. He's on the River X where the Romans have founded a port for Exeter called Topsham, modern Topsham. Yeah. And it seems he refused to move from a means of escape if the province fell on the River X, so he could get into the channel and then to the continent. And he says no. And in case I forget later, ultimately, when he receives word that Boudicca has been defeated, he commits suicide. Such is the fate of those who bring shame to the honour of the world of Rome. Oh, okay. Very good. Oh, okay. Oh, good one. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Oh, thank you. Okay, that's really interesting. Okay, the, uh, I didn't know that. That's good. So, so there we, we the, go. The, 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 this is the Temple of Claudius, uh, the te Temple to the Divine Claudius in Colchester, which, remember, is the imperial um, capital. Next slide. Here we can see the, um, the uh, veterans... Uh, who've been settled in the colonia of, uh, of Colchester, uh, which, remember, um, a colonia is one of the three kinds of Roman towns or cities, and it's there as a place for veterans to, be, to settle in. So the main population, the male population in Colchester would have been former legionaries and auxilia. And here we can see them defending, trying to defend the Temple of um, Claudius from the uh, rampaging uh, uh, native Britons. Next slide. 
but they fail. <laughs> and apparently, uh, most of the native Britons who survived the wider sack of Colchester tried to save themselves in the temple, and they were burnt to death. Next slide. Here we can see Cerealis's uh, embarrassing defeat. Interestingly, as an aside, Cerealis actually regains imperial favour because he sides with is, is a kinsman of Vespasian, and in the year of the four emperors in AD 69, sides with Vespasian and gets given command of the Roman campaign to defeat the um, the Batavian revolt of uh, Civilis, and then gets made the governor of Britain by Vespasian to say thank you. But here, early in his career, uh, he's very much not the martial leader. He actually runs away and leaves his legionaries to be massacred. Next slide. Here we can see early Roman London. So you can see here, this is the initial street pattern built between probably AD 50. The first forum was built in AD 50 and AD 60, 61. But there's no wall. Remember, the wall doesn't get built until late in the second century by Septimius Severus. So there's no land wall. So effectively, you have a, a mercantile place with lots of wealth. The first image, with the, the first uh, named individual we have from Roman London is on a tablet found uh, in, in an excavation in the Warbrook by Museum of London Archaeology, where I'm honoured to be an ambassador. And that names a certain individual who's a freed man trader, and it marks a financial transaction, which is dated to AD 57. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, Roman London, just like today, is a place of trade. But crucial thing here, Simon, there's no wall, so it's mm -hmm. wide open. So so for Paulinus, thinking about going down there, that would be a suicide. If, if anybody watched our first one with uh, Attila facing the Romans with his backs to the river and a camp, he would have effectively committed himself to that, but outnumbered six to one. So it would have been uh, disastrous. And um, loss of province. And, and that, that, that would have been it. That would have been it. That would have been it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so next, next, next yeah, slide. Yeah. And here we can see St. Torbans. So that's a recreation of uh, St. Torbans of the Roman period. And again, a picture of it being torched by Boudicca. So these are effectively, let's remember, these are the three key towns of Roman Britain at this point. You have the provincial capital uh, of Colchester. You have the key emporium in London. And you have St. Torbans, which is highly developed by this time. and is also another emporium. Hmm. Next slide. So where could this battle have taken place? Well, most modern interpretations say that Boudicca needed to actually get this media engagement over. If she got a force of 230,000 people, of 100,000 maybe warriors, she got to feed them, she got to provide water for them, etc. And she knew she got the one chance to, to get rid of the Romans because if she failed, then she knew what the fate would be because the Romans treated recalcitrant native populations exceptionally harshly. Remember, Severus gave a, an order, committed a genocide in Scotland in AD 210 when the Caledonians of Maite revolted there. And, and bef uh, uh, just after this time, the Silurians, the, the when the Romans are conquering Wales, they also uh, have uh, a genocidal order uh, ordered against them when they rebel as well. So Boudicca knew that she'd got to get this over with quickly. So I think she marched quickly at Watling Street. So she torched St. Torbans. Nothing else on Watling Street, the A5 north of St. Torbans, has been torched. That includes the next town, Roman town, Dunstable. So the battle would have taken place in that narrative somewhere between High Cross, where we know Paul Linus sent words to, to Augusta, and St. Albans, somewhere there. So what are the candidate places? Well, from uh, northwest to southeast, you've got Manchester, you've got High Cross itself, you have Church Stowe, which is uh, in, uh, next to Weedon Beck. Those of you um, who played in our competitions in Daventry at Battlefield Hobbies will not have known you were in walking distance of one of the most likely sites where this battle took place, from the Crossroads uh, Hotel, where uh, many of us have had fine nights uh, having a drink and recounting our wargaming stories. If you, talk, if you turn left out of the car park entrance to the Crossroads Hotel there, you're literally within five minutes of where the Roman legionaries would have been deployed. How spooky is that? Who knew? Um, and then you have Marchiate. Now, Marchiate is a bowl-shaped valley on the A5, uh, just to the southeast of Dunstable. So any one of those. So let's have a look at the candidates. The two pictures on the right are uh, high cross. I thought you'd like to see those because you can see the, uh, the, the, uh, the ditches there, the double ditches of a Roman marching camp, uh, which was earlier interpreted as being part of this uh, campaign. But actually, it's now been found the marching camp lies underneath the crossroads of Watling Street and uh, the Foss Way. So actually, that predates this period. So it's pr probably not there. Let's look at the next slide, though, Simon. 
I think it might well have been here. This is Church Stow. Remember, Wiedenbeck is the Germanic, so Saxon name for um, pagan temple on the hill. A lot of the churches around Church Stow have got reused Roman stone, which look as though it could have come from battlefield monuments, which would have been built by the Romans very normally after the event of defeating an opponent. <clears throat> so you can see here that what you're seeing here is the Roman legionaries view of the battlefield. The very bottom, where you can see the fields, which are sort of a light brown, that's the A5, that's Watling Street. Um, there's talk in the primary sources of the native British families actually setting out to have a picnic to watch the Romans be defeated on a, on a, on a, on a sort of a round hill at the bottom of the bowl-shaped valley. Well, that's on the right-hand side. And then the Romans would have deployed if this was the case. If you bring the... That's spot on, Simon. Uh, and if you bring the, the... That's it. This is where the Romans would have deployed. So, so I'll talk about the actual deployment in a minute, but basically it looks like the Romans had marching camps deployed either side of their deployment um, to protect themselves. And it seems as though you have this sort of U-shaped, U bowl-shaped valley with a funnel at the bottom <clears throat> with the high ground on either side uh, protected by woods. And on the other side of the high ground, you've got the valleys of the Neen and the Ouse, sorry, the, uh, the Neen and the Avon. So therefore... There are rivers either side, which would have had riverine woodland, which is very dense. So that's going to protect the flank. So it's very difficult for the Romans to get, the, the Britons to get through it. And for added protection, the Romans have deployed marching camps. So there are at least three known marching camps uh, in this region, which could have anchored the Roman flank. So I think there's a very strong likelihood what you're seeing there is the Roman view of the Britons approaching. So next slide, please, Simon. Very good. <laughs> Next slide. So there what you've got is uh, an image of a famous scene where the primary sources talk about Boudicca exhorting her troops to have this one final push to uh, defeat, um, to defeat uh, the Romans. Simon, can you hear me? Because I can't hear you. If you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. I can hear you. Yeah, I just... Oh, I that's just fine. Muted. I've muted it That's for great. a second. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Just making sure the IT is working. So there's a famous scene where Boudicca exalts her troops to one final big push. Now, if you were to walk into the uh, British Museum Romano British Gallery, the first image you see today when it's reopened is this figure of a, a very angry middle-aged woman. This this figure comes from a field the other side of the Churchstow battle site. And that field is called Dead Queen's Field. And an interpretation is that this is the head of Boudicca, as would have been uh, as would have been a feature on one of the monumental Roman battle sites. <clears throat> so it's a coincidence, but it's an interesting coincidence. Um, that is how the Romans would have viewed, viewed Boudicca. <laughs> Next image. Yeah. Shall I pick up these two, Simon? Just to... Yeah, you, you, go for, you go for those two, and then I'll go back to the Chicken battle site. Troops. Yeah, because you were just talking a bit about the troops for people that were involved and, and um, how we deal with some of them. So uh, Boudicca's army... There's 100,000, 230,000, depending on who you listen to it. Of, of course, a vast number of those will have been a gathering of general people. So there'll be an awful lot of uh, followers, spectators, hangers-on, and it would be a pretty large proportion of the population of the area she'd gone through, I think, at that point in time. Um, famous for the chariots. The chariots were lightish vehicles carrying a, a, a javelin man. They, they, they used them to skirmish, to drive around, rattle, they made a lot of noise. Um, there isn't a lot of evidence for the sides, just a little discussion that was going on earlier. Some people mention it on the Roman side, but they do like exaggerating their enemies to make them sound rather better than they were. There's actually been a few dug up and there's no sign of signs of this, on the ones that were dug up. So, um, so that doesn't really uh, apply. Um, and there's a little recreation of one, modern recreation of one there um, down the bottom. So they're quite light uh, vehicles. They, they also use them to carry a few troops, a bit like tank riders in World War II and jump off and fight and engage in combat a bit. That's something else that was that was talked about. But mainly they rattled all in the front, made a hell of a lot of noise and spent time skirmishing and throwing javelins. And we treat chariots in Meg as missile carrying devices for most of their evolution, all through the biblical era and through these later ones in the Gallic era. There are very few that are actually designed to smack into something. That actually isn't a thing that chariots would be inclined to do. I mean, cavalry find it difficult controlling one horse to force themselves into something that's 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 tough and formed. Trying and controlling two, three or four to all do the same thing, it would be an impossibility. So these are really high quality skirmish troops that ultimately, if they got engaged, would end up with the warriors, high quality warriors fighting in foot. And, the, and then the classic 
uh, troop type we've got here is a is a variety of warband types. You've got the uh, the classic woad that they tended to paint themselves in when going into battle. Um, they were renowned for fierce charges to a degree. There's been a debate we've had about whether really they should be devastating charges or short spin with javelins for some of these types. But we treat all these as devastating charges who will tend to get stuck in if they get near any enemy. Um, and certainly in this battle, they got they got stuck in on mass against not many very not very many, but some very very skillful enemy. And um, Pauline's at the time's got about ten thousand troops from two really veteran legions. So from what Sam was saying earlier, those two legions have been conquering for some time. Uh, they are not novices. Uh, they're nothing like the ones that we talked about when we did uh, some of the refights, like Can I, where they've recruited troops desperately to try and build up forces to take on an enemy. They are actually really top-notch troops. So you've, you've got a lot of the classic era Roman legionary that people first think about with their Loric Segment Tartar armor, uh, fully equipped. They, they'd have the auxilia for the era, and it's an era where they had some of the uh, um, some of the other bow troops as well. So, that, so the, the Romans in this battle, it's a small force, but it's very well led, and it's got absolutely superb quality troops against an absolute mob of these led by a number of those so you we're going to be representing that on the battlefield it, 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 it leads to some quite interesting pictures simon i'll just pass you back to your photos your final photos it's, it's, it's worth saying as well what the uh, what the romans have got simon which the britons had was any it was a line of battle cavalry and they played a key role in the battle as well remember yes. As, as all of us as war gamers know, most casualties in, in, in any battle, but certainly in the ancient world, take place when one army routes, one pursues. And the ability to have the cavalry there to carry out this pursuit um, is, uh, is, is a key factor. Remember Caesar in his first incursion in 55 BC, his cavalry didn't arrive, so it could effectively mm. do nothing because he couldn't scout and he couldn't pursue a defeated enemy, so he just stayed in his marching camp, effectively. Um, so, so Plautus here has a number of advantages. So think of them as a spitfire of their day. And then we can see in the image on the left-hand side the uh, view of the Britons of um, the Roman deployments at the top of the hill. So there we see some native British slingers firing their slings. There we see some chariots riding up and down the line, uh, hurling insults and throwing javelins. <clears throat> what it's worth remembering, though, is this. The Romans on the top of that ridge are tooled up. And it's almost like, remember the movie Zulu Dawn, when um, the, uh, the Martini Henry sort of range markers are hammered into the ground. Mm. Uh, so this is happening here. So the, the Roman sappers from within the legions would have already put markers in the ground for each of the weapon ranges. So remember mm. a Roman legion, and there's more than one legion here, had uh, 10 or more ballista which are the larger bolt shooters or stone throwers, and over 50 Scorpios. And in this battle, I think they had a lot more because they drained all the materials out of all the logis logistics spaces. Um, so as the Britons advanced, and we'll see it on a map later, they would have first been hit by the ballista um, bolts or stones, then by the Scorpio bolts, then the arrows, and then the slings, and then the lighter pillar from the legionaries and finally just before the point of impact which is why we call it immortal mcvorium an impact weapon the heavy pillar so by the time this this mob of britons had got to anywhere near the roman lines it was in probably disarray because it had this bombardment as it was funneled towards the romans in a dense mass so next picture simon and this is another great image. This is from our mate, uh, Nigel, Nigel Empson, um, who's doing a great job. Nigel's actually, Simon, you're this. I've, co I've commissioned him to do six of these battle maps, 3D ones, for Romans at War. So actually, all the battle maps in the Romans at War book could be from Nigel, all based Fantastic. on the work that he's done, done, done for us. So <laughs> spreading, spreading, the, spreading the Meg love. Uh, but here you can see exactly what happened here. So you can see Watling Street. You can see Boudicca advancing at Watling Street. You can see the Avon to the north closing off part of the Bolshevik Valley. The Britons then head in towards this Bolshevik Valley through, through the funnel. And I think at this point, Boudicca loses control because this is a mob. It's not a, it's not, it's not a professional fighting force, as you will find with uh, the Romans. This is, this is effectively a mob. It's torched three cities, got loads of loot in its baggage train. It's got its families there wanting to see the Romans massacred. Boudicca, steady as, she, steady as you go, uh, deploys along the ridge, uh, anchors his uh, flanks with marching camps. 
He's got the the legions in the centre, and he deploys them in four bodies, actually. Two bodies, um, a, a centre, a left and a right, and a reserve at the rear. He deploys the auxilia on their flanks, and then the auxiliary cavalry on their flanks. So it's a very, very, very secure position. The Britons, in my interpretation, can't flank him. And even if mm. they could, they're not a professional enough army to be able to make use of it. So they mm. just rush headlong for the Romans and into the trap. And what happens is this. I've described the bombardment, but at the point when the, the clash takes place and the Romans, the legionaries have fought, thrown their, their, their heavy pillar, they, the, the, the auxiliaries have thrown their, um, their, their short spears, the, the gladius are drawn, the scutums, the auxiliary shields are set, and they take their hit. And you can imagine this classic fencing technique the Romans use against most opponents from the north, where the, the Britons here, if they've got swords at all, are using long slashing iron swords. So the blow would go over the top onto the big Gallic imperial helmet, be deflected or be caught by the scutum. But the Romans then lift the scutum and expose the, the midriff of the native Britons and the gladius gets stabbed in or it goes over the top and stabbed through the upper chest. Remember the gladius as well is a terror weapon. It's a psychological weapon as we've discussed before, because it has no runnels. So the air can't get into a wound. There's no way for the blood to come out of a wound. So the gladius sticks. The only way to get it out is to give it a vicious twist. So you have these gaping, massive, sanguinous wounds. And the butchering starts. And at some stage, Plautus realizes that, that it's all working in his favor. So it gives the order for the legionaries in particular to form what the primary sources call coenus, which are swinehead or wedge formations. And these are then, there's probably 30 or 40 of them across the frontage, then start doing the step advance down the hill, step, 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 driving the Britons into a closer and closer dense pack, um, group, group where they can't use any weapons at all. Those who are in control of themselves, most wouldn't have been. This is like Cana, but writ large. And the butchering takes place. But the Britons can't flee because they've got the camp followers and families at the back, sort of like the first bull run in the Civil War, sitting there expecting a big victory, and suddenly they're part of the problem. So it's an absolute massacre, and the primary sources say at least 80,000 are killed. So at least maybe a third, probably more of the whole force Boudicca had, fighting or not, is absolutely butchered. Uh, and it's a massive victory for the Romans, which is why I think, in actual fact, it's a strong chance that the Romans did build battlefield monuments along Watling Street here to commemorate what was certainly, to my mind, the most important battle of the whole history of Roman Britain. Because yes. if Boudicca had won, Roman Britain would have fallen. Uh, but Paulinus won, and it was a huge victory. Uh, so there you go. Next slide, please, Simon. And there's a great image, actually. I mean, I've been up on this site two or three times uh, because uh, a few of us are trying to put together a, a pitch to do a, do a mainstream television program of an archaeological investigation of it to prove it is the battle site. This is inside one of the Roman marching camps there. You can see the, the cuspate entrance there. You can see the, the banks. The ditches are on the far side. You're standing in the middle of a Roman marching camp there. That's a very enigmatic uh, image. That's called Battle Dykes, by the way. Again, probably 10 minutes walk from the Crossroads uh, Hotel. Next one. And what happened? What was the ultimate outcome of Boudicca's failure? This is Venturi Sonorum, which is the Civitatis capital, so the county town capital of the Roman uh, of Roman North Norfolk. Um, Colchester, uh, sorry, um, Canterbury is a good example of a, of a thriving Civitatis capital. Silchester is one. Roxeter is one. This isn't one. This is the least developed of all the Civitatis capitals in Roman Britain, simply because of a massive depopulation event in North Norfolk after the defeat of Boudicca, and it never really recovered. Next one, please. But it's a what if to consider what would have happened if Boudicca had won. This is quite a good interpretation of the re-establishment of uh, the tribes of Roman Britain. The only part of Britain which the Romans may have tried to keep hold of was effectively the extreme southeast, where the Cantiaci, interestingly, didn't join the revolt for some reason, probably very sensibly, but mm. all the others in the southeast did. Um, that's what may have happened, but ultimately it didn't because Paul Linus was on his A game and fought the perfect battle. Next one. So if this had, so if, if this had happened and they'd lost, we'd have uh, we'd never have had a Hadrian's Wall. In fact, we'd probably have had a North Downs Wall or something, wouldn't we? It's, well, it's more than that. You'd never have had a stone-built environment north of the, the southeast. I mean, remember the, the native Britons didn't try and keep hold of uh, London when they, they, they got there. They sacked it and burnt it to the ground. They didn't try and keep hold of Camelodunum. 
They didn't try and keep hold of St Albans. They burnt it to the ground. They'd have reverted to their own apida and their own uh, settlement patterns. There'd have been no stone-built urban environment. Remember, the Romans never conquered the far north of Britain. So there is no mm. Roman stone-built environment north of the line of Hadrian's Wall yes. because the Romans okay. never conquered it. Well, that would have happened in the south. This is a crucial yeah. battle in British history because it changes the direction of British history. Yeah, because the, de- uh, the whole developmental future of this area would have changed completely, wouldn't it? Yeah. There'd have been no Burnley Football Club, mate. Damn. Okay. Well done, That's how dramatic. Excellent. That's important, though. So, this is quite a dramatic battle. Rich has just added a great comment. He said that when we fought the Savage one, the legionaries got squashed together and couldn't really use their weapons well until Caesar reorganised them, which is a, a good point. And this is kind of like the reverse, where the British have no ability to use their weapons or use the space, but they haven't got a Caesar in charge of their ability to adapt. So, it just... It just becomes mayhem in a valley. So this is really uh, this is the UK's <laughs> death valley. So I think that's a good, that's a good comment. So I'll, I'll, I'll remember that for the TV program. <laughs> yeah, it's good, isn't it? Yeah, thank you, Richard. Yeah. Always got always got a good like, good bit thrown in there from uh, from our list master. So we've refought the battle a few times. So we're going to just talk about Simon's Maximus version, and then I'm going to talk about my Pacto version. And I've actually played a bit of a what if as well, just to just to test out a few things. So moving on to the armies for Simon's Maximus game. This is what he's created. So you can see there, basically, I've minimized the size of the Roman army. So I've effectively got um, two tugs of eight auxilia, which are standard auxilia, but with everything. Uh, I've got three tugs of eight legionaries, two from... um, uh, 14 Gemina and one from Valeria Victrix uh, and they've got everything and they're superior. I've uh, given each of the legionaries a light bolt shooter. I've additionally upgraded two separate bolt shooters to heavy artillery with barricades as a one-off in this list. So it's one of the things that Richard's discussed where when we're recreating historical battles, what we might do is have additional things in the list but only for historical battles. Um, and then they've got two alara of four, two tugs of four uh, auxiliary cavalry with everything um, on mm-hmm. the extreme flanks. So all my auxiliary cavalry and infantry got shooting charge. So it's as tall up as it can be, and it's uphill as well. And the Britons, yeah. I've got three. Uh, then if you go to the British list, uh, that's seventeen tugs plus a sug, so uh, nine slingers, and then three tugs of six nobles, uh, one tug of six chariots that's superior. And the rest, straightforward forward warband. In terms of command and control, I've given Boudica uh, herself as a talented general and then three competents and Paul Linus as a talented and two competents. Mm. <clears throat> and, and then again as an d- addition when I've refought this battle twice with Alex. Additionally, I also gave the Romans shock because uh, uh, they already have shove, remember, because the Britons are loose. Uh, but in that first recreation, effectively the game is over in one move. <laughs> because the way that I've de- the way I've deployed my Britons, could you show my, my deployment to the Britons, please, Simon? Yeah, you got it there. There we go. I, I've actually stacked my Brit- British tugs um, three deep across the board. So what you have there is when the tug at the front goes, the tugs behind get two cab tests because they get the cab test for the breakthrough fleeing and the cab test for the the break. <clears throat> and you have this real shock effect, and that actually smacked straight through the whole British army in about two turns when, when I gave the, the, the legionary shot. Um, so, so the two innovations I introduced for the second recreation were to introduce a means of reflecting Boudicca losing control. So Alex and I rolled a dice at the beginning of every turn, a d6, and if the Romans rolled higher, and Alex was the Romans, um, then Boudicca lost control, and everything impetuously went for the nearest Roman unit. And that happened in that game on turn three, which had a big, a, a big impact. But also, crucially here, Paul Linus had incredible command and control of his force. So you can mm-hmm. imagine the, 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 the feelings of these Roman legionaries on the top of this crest. as this huge force starts um, sort of coming down the, the, down the valley towards them, you know. Paul Linus, Paul Linus would have been going up and down saying, steady in the ranks, steady lads, you've done this before, this, 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 is, going to be a, this is going to be a picnic, etc." clearly knowing it's not. So I, I introduced a random factor here as well. So in the same thing, at the beginning of every turn, I rolled a dice, and if I rolled a six of the Britons, I got control for one turn's movement of a Roman unit. And actually, I did. <laughs> so in the second battle, turn four, just and also in my battle... The flanks hit the Roman flanks first, 
Uh, but the artillery started taking chunks out of the British centre because of the longevity of the fire, because it's further to go, which is quite historical, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, the key, key thing here was because the, Rome, the Britons lost control so early, Boudicca wasn't able to charge her chariots, even uphill, against the auxiliary cavalry, where although they were plus one on the, the uphill, she, with her short spears with the chariots, was superior, so she'd have had green on green. She had to charge and be shot at coming in without, instead of being able to shoot herself first. And therefore, the chariots lost bases going in and the flanks quickly, quickly collapsed. But one of the Roman legions, the ones next to the, 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 the heavy ballista, stepped forward into the valley, which at the time looked as though it was actually going to cost, cost the, the, the Britain, the, the, the Romans dear. But in the event, the Roman legionaries were still so good compared to their opponents that they held firm with probably yeah. average, slightly above average dice rolls. And in the event of the two games, the only units which the Romans lost was in the second game, when with the third wave of what was by then five out of eight, having been cabbed twice and twice again, uh, warriors hitting the auxiliaries on the right-hand flank, they'd been thinned down to an, such an extent they broke. So that's the only unit. So it had a penetration just over the hill line behind the Roman line. But at that point, the British army broke again. So even with things weighted in favour of the Britons, with those randomizations, the Britons still, in the recreation that I put together, face an almost insurmountable task, such as the skill and quality of Paulinus Force. Hmm. And just to, just if I may add a few things as a, as a rule creator, I think a few of the things that work, even without changing anything uh, in the rules, just standard in the rules, is the, the command and control here you've got very you've got very few tugs to control with the Romans, but you've got a high quality professional general and two tribunes who are going to be perfectly competent with those two legions. So you've got a lot of cards actually to control very little, and you're in a defensive position. So you 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 will find they can actually store up quite a lot of cards usually to recover themselves throughout the battle. So it's kind of uh, high quality generals running along the line. This is a bit. This is a bit welling to Waterloo when I play it with uh, with uh, Gloire de Guerre type things, or when I did Quatre Bras. His ability to walk along the lines with what he's got spare and keep the troops going, because he's not having to use a lot of stuff to to command and control the other troops. The second thing that works really well in this, and it just it actually makes the game, is the cab test concept with the breakthroughs of Raiders. Because they've set the British army up here to suffer the worst possible version <laughs> of that kind of event. If the front goes, it's all going to go through the second wave. And, and actually that goes through the third wave. And it, we've got automatically in the rules this chaos effect built in already as standard. And then you add the characteristics that we have for the Romans, which we've talked about many times. This allows you to fully load them. So these are, as Simon says, these are fully, fully loaded up legions. They've got pretty much everything. Not quite. I've got one more thing in mind, but they're pretty much everything on there that, that, that you have in a legion. Superior, the, the integral artillery, shield cover, melee expert. I mean, they are stacked to actually the limit in terms of the quality of a, a Roman army with, with quality command. And in, interestingly, the points are an interesting guide, about 9,300. I'll pick this up as I go through mine versus 11,000. So actually, the Britons have got a roughly 20% advantage in points. <clears throat> okay? Yeah, get murdered. Yeah. So it just shows the difference in competence between the Roman plan and, and the Britain's execution between those two uh, between those two two battles. So that was a that's a big two nil for the uh, uh, the Romans. They won fifteen nil and fifteen two. Was it? Yeah. Actually, yeah. one one final reflection, Simon. There that you can see on the picture is you can see that this 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 uh, well the Death Valley as it's now being dubbed even on telly it's going to be called Death Valley um, in Churchstone. Um, one of the key things as archaeologists we're going to be looking for, given there are over 80,000 battlefield casualties on the British side, are the burial pits. Because somewhere around there, think of the burial pits that we found at the Battle of Towton. Somewhere around there, if this is the battle site, there will be burial pits with thousands and thousands of bodies buried from mm. um, AD 6061. Uh, and that's what we're going to use GeoFizz for. All those of you who remember Time Team, we're getting a GeoFizz team up here to do the entire site. Mm. Over to you, brother. Okay, so I've put mine out in Pacto. I'm going, to, I'm going to try and show you a little bit of it live in the way it, it pans out originally. So um, very, very similar concepts. I've got the exact same structure in terms of command and control. Obviously, with Pacto, these are in twos. Uh, I've, I've done 
two tugs for each legion of two bases and I've given them a light artillery integral in the way that we allow it in the larger game to represent the, the artillery. So again, this has got quite a high density of artillery. It's got two bases worth of artillery and there are only 14 bases in total. So it's got a decent proportion of artillery, much higher than a, than a, a typical legion. They're all stacked totally. The one thing that I've stacked in addition is they've got orbs. And the auxilia on the edges, to mm. represent the sort of camp effects, I've given them barricades. And we'll come back to that a little later, especially in the, in the what-if scenario. And then we've got two small, uh, again, fully stacked heavy cavalry units. And again, I've even made these superior. So the whole thing is superior other than the auxilia, who are actually uh, defending barricades anyway on the, on the wings, part of the, part of the forts on the side. Breaks on four, like Simon's does, a small army, 2,900 points. Uh, this is the Britons. It's a little hard to read because it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, oh no, that's Simon's Britons. I've gone to the wrong one. That's easy to read. This is my Britons. You have to get your magnifying glass out for this one. So um, I have got a grand total of twenty-seven tugs in my version, okay, and six tugs. So I've got uh, four chariots, four chariots in twos, two of them superior. I've got the nobles, like Simon, representing two tribal leaders. Uh, and I've got experienced warriors to go with them to make up a decent sized force. And then the general mob of warriors I've classified as poor. So there's waves of poor sitting behind the waves of decent. Um, remember, at this stage, they've already fought one battle against the Romans, against Hispana, nine. So they will have lost some gear, but they'll have lost some of their better fighters as well. There's casualties in wiping out that legion as well. And I've got the families sitting at the back. So this is an absolute mob, even, even more so. And two slingers, two javelin men, and two of the light horse as well. So on the tabletop at setup, it looks like that. So similar to Simon's, but it probably looks even more compressed in impacto. I've got the uh, the Romans on the hill, the two legions. There's the auxilia sitting on the wings. The cavalry set back a little bit. Wooded, forested hills on the sides. And in the battle, it talks really about waves with the slingers and the the slingers are here. The slingers and the chariots forming the first wave. And I start the battle with them just inside, outside charge range for one go, but inside artillery range. So you've got that. Then you've got a wave of decent Britons. These are the superiors with the averages either side and two generals. So those charges could go in with generals. And then you've got waves, waves of poor troops behind there with, with Boudicca actually controlling the waves plus the chariots. Important, you know, she doesn't need to be with the chariots to a block move. Of course. She only has to be in range. So that was, that was set up in a pretty fascinating way. And actually, I played that one twice. And I played that one without any fancy rules about automatic charges. I've just used every card I can to push the Britons forward. And actually, that's another interesting thing. Even though Boudic is classified as, as in this game quite well, there are so many troops to move that it's hard work getting them all, getting them all forward. But you do manage, to, do manage to do it. And I'll show you how it plays out in a, in a minute. Um, but you'll, you'll find it quite interesting historically. Um, both those battles ended up being 15 nils to the Romans. Both the ones played out in the true historical way of the, effectively the mob trying to get up to the, the uphill position. Um, and so again, the, the difference in tactics manages to uh, compensate for, in my, in my force, what is a slightly bigger difference, I think, in percentage. It's 3,000 points of Romans, roughly speaking, against 4,000 points of Britons. So the Britons have a full one-third advantage in points. But it turned, into a, it turned into a slaughter. So what I've also done for you, and I'm going to show you in a few minutes after I've just done a little bit of the beginning of this game, because this will give you a feel for a few things, is I did a what-if scenario and said to myself, well, let's imagine the, the Britons had a little bit more, uh, more nice about them and were a little bit more cautious about them, which they clearly didn't. They were, they, their blood was... and try and do something on the flanks and let's be a little bit more cautious here not just go charging in let's try and time it properly which is interesting as a test of the point because as a war gamer we don't have to follow what they did in history we probably would if we were there because we'd probably all be bloodied up the same way charging up the hill thinking we're going to win but actually with the hindsight playing out as a rule test we can of course do what we like so i tried that one as well so it, 
with that, I'm just going to try and now bring my phone online as a presenter, but hopefully keeping my headphones on, we won't get we won't get too many issues. So I'm going to make oh, make attendee. Okay, that means it's already there. Let me let me see if I can put some put something on for you, and and get that running. Should be. Let's see. Here we go. Hopefully this will work. Hopefully this will work. Hopefully this will work. Sounds like War of the World. It does for the moment until I need to get rid of some volume. There we go. So if I position this somehow right now i'm going to turn the camera around just a second i should be able to get you a decent view of this battlefield got the legs a bit stronger how's that turn, turn my mic off simon turn my mic off i'll turn my mic off on here in fact i'll turn my video off as well so it's a bigger picture Hopefully you can still hit me through my phone. Is that right? Perfect. Okay. So, Simon, can you turn your video off as well? We'll let them all see it big screen. It's probably worth doing. Done. <laughs> so, so here I am. You can see the hands now, and you can see the battlefield. So this would this is actually this is actually set up to be ready for the. The, the right side charge range, that's a six. The right side charge range, so we'll be shooting. So the first thing in the rules that's, that works with this battle is if you're shooting with artillery against chariots, you actually get an upgrade. So there is the potential in this game, and Simon talked about earlier that the, the records talk about the chariots being turned into chaos at the front with bits of chariots everywhere um, due to the sequence of missile fire as they went in. So we'll see it in phases. So I'm going to get a green dice with these guys against against one of these so we'll uh, we'll see what we can do against this chariot here oh miss i'll roll it in sight for you probably easier ah only got only got an s against that got a wing against that so not too bad nothing too serious okay and then they will be moving i haven't dealt any discs out yet so let me put some discs out because i've sort of set those up in advance i'll use the green ones so they blend in so i'm giving i'm giving myself three for each of these legion commanders. So he's got three there. He's got a red and a white. That's not bad. I can cope with that because he doesn't need to do much. And Paulinus at the back with four. Yellow head. There we go. Got some nice colours there. And then I've got Boudicca in the middle. I think in this latest version I've, I've run as a Run as a legendary, so she can do the fives at the back. So I'll give her five for now in this final variant. So that's for her sitting in this setup. I've got her sitting there. She likes it. I've got the chariots there all around. Excuse me. She's sitting there with all of those. So we've got plenty there. Two competents who each got three tugs of warriors. So like a tribe, effectively. A tribe of three tugs. There they are. And another competent at the back with a, another mass of backup troops and the families. So there we go. So there's a reasonable mix there. Now, of course, the Romans don't actually need to do anything in this battle for the time being. So he'll distribute his discs. So he's going to make sure that actually both of them have got a red and a yellow to save for the future. And that will allow them to build up some capacity to take some strain later in the battle. So effectively, I'm going to get that out of the way for the sake of time, as there's going to be absolutely nothing happening for them on their front. They're just going to take the impact initially and use their missile weapons. By the end of this turn, those two subbies are sitting on a red and a yellow already. You can see that. So that's, that's rather handy. The Britons over here, well, she can, she can do a block move from a distance in range. So she's going to use two of her discs. So she'll use a white and upgrade green to move all four chariots up to get them into javelin range. So they're going to come up 
here and start to put themselves in a position to try and pepper the javelins. And the slingers will go with them. So there's a bit of missile fire capability coming up the hill there. And then behind them, these guys will each do a directly ahead block move with their three. So they'll, they'll keep pace. So they're all eager to get up the hill. Have a go at these uh, nasty Romans. He won't be wanted to keep that one. This guy can do the save and afford to keep a yellow for later. So I'm going to fly that those forward. I'm going to go fairly quickly and then I'll pause at the end of a turn. So we get we get that with him saving one. So that's what we've got there. Boudica, of course, can do more. So she's with those. So she'll do black for directly ahead and a yellow and do a block move of five. So she'll, she'll be pulling forward another wave and they'll be dragging forward these skirmishes on the end. So you can see, actually, just with no deviation, the rules done this way, but with this sort of objective, you, get a, you do get a lot of troops moving. They're all, they're all flying forwards into fighting position. And then this guy at the back, uh, he's got enough there to do three of them, and he's going to deliberately save a red for later. And then he can do another block move later if he wants to. So there we go. So there's a bit of fast action. So there's a load of... There's a lot of movement done. So that's what we get at the end of that turn. So the, the important things to note at that point is the Romans managing to save all these lovely discs, which are quite handy later for a different type of fight. And the, and the Britons have managed to get most of the troops and the mob moving, uh, and they're advancing in waves. So the next turn, there's two choices now for the Britons. Um, I think in history, they would have, first of all, had to go throwing some javelins because that's what they determined to do. And then eventually, they'd probably figure out they, could, they weren't doing much damage and they probably threw themselves into some sort of fight. But let's, let's do them standing around for one go and trying to throw some javelins. So if we did the next turn, I'll deal out a few more discs. So he gains one. He gains one. Paulinus gains his four. And this accumulation of... Red discs. And the other thing is that in the game, I suppose, by storing up red discs, it makes it more difficult for the Britons to do anything clever. So the game mechanism has a little thing twist in it that if you fight an opponent who can sit there and store up discs as Polinus can here, it makes it even more difficult for the Britons to start doing anything clever because the odds of them getting red and yellow discs is declining all the time as the, as the Romans store them up because they're saving them to actually recover wounds later. Here we go. And five for the, for the lovely redhead, who I'll keep in my imagination looking like the lovely picture on the left of, of Simon's slide, just for the sake of it. Make sure I'm sticking on one on the, on the right. Okay, so they don't declare any charges. These are far enough away to have no devastating charge effects, so they're, they're going to throw a load of javelins and fire the slings. But of course, the Romans have got shield cover. So shield cover is a, is a fantastic protection for them against missile fire, so they can downgrade everything to black as a result. So there's going to be blacks along the line. See if we do anything. Nothing so far. That's got to there. Three more to go on there. Got a wound on one. Uh, that would be that one. That one will try and do the same one. Nothing. And then that's going to shoot up the one behind the barricade, so even without shield cover, it doesn't it? So actually, what you, what you find is the pure missile bit they will have tried. These Romans are hunkered down behind their shields, locking everything together. It, it's going to be, it, it really is going to be like pebbles bouncing off armour. It's not going to be doing a huge amount to them. Unfortunately, the return fire of the two ballistas potentially does. So that one there, it's a wound. And that one there, there's nothing. So, okay, so the base gun of chariots there already from the missile fire. Okay, so I'm going to accelerate the next bit without bothering doing too much of the, the fancy stuff just to show you what happens because it pretty much happens systematically. They'll save all the good ones, so we'll have those in reserve. Of course, he'll use one of those to take that off. So the Britons have now done absolutely nothing. And with this not mob wanting to run up behind them, really there's little choice to do anything but charge in with these chariots in the game because you really have to get there. Because now even the Britons will be probably realising, well, they're not doing much. They're not getting anywhere. And they've got a mob behind them, so... They're just going to have to do that. And these will all follow up and be tight behind them. And these will all be tight behind those. 
we won't we won't need to do the cards particularly and these will probably have caught up with those so you'll end up with something like this as these guys crash in but with this sort of situation even with a superior chariot here you're going to have some trouble plus we've got the artillery on the way in again so these artillery now hit that one so that's a wound on that one that artillery will shoot that one didn't do anything so in this game, the artillery has not done a huge amount. There's not too many pieces of stuff out there. But if we work our way through, even if the Britons time it and start with a superior, they've got superior short spear for their for theirs, for their chariots. And the, the Romans back, they are superior impact weapon uphill. So actually, it's, gonna, it's going to be um, two up for the Romans in that particular fight, even against the superior ones. There you go. So that's a, that's a dead one there. Dead base gun, do that sideways. We'll do that one. That's a wound on the on the chariot. These are actually average chariots, so only half of them are superior in the list, which has got upgrade up to half. So these are going to be even better off. So it's short spear against impact weapon, superior and uphill. Tempting to stick a general in almost, but we'll, we'll not risk it. So there's a wound there. And if we do the one on the other end here, there's a win there. So see, look, actually, they've not actually managed to dent the Romans on the hill. But wound down, wound down, base down, wound down already. And if we do a melee phase now, these even lose the facts that they've got. And now they're going to be against uphill melee expert and superior. So there's three. So they're three up on these. So we'll just do that one. That breaks those. They're two up against the superior ones. That one's okay. Next one along the line has suffered a base. And if we do the one at the end, we're back to three up again, even without throwing generals in, lose a base. And now we get to the bit of the rules that causes this reenactment to work as it did in history, which is cab tests. Okay? Because we've just broken, we've broken one of the chariots. I think it was that one, if I remember rightly. So we get cab test to the side, three base widths, which is one and a half. So there's a cab test on the average chariot there. Didn't see that. That one's broken as well. We, we have now got a cab test on that. We actually have two on that one. Now because of the two breaks, that one's broken too. And now we've got this one. Well, that's going to be on a green. And it's going to suffer two of them. And that one survived. So only one of them is left. But of course, the problem is what's left of them do a right through these. So there's now going to be cab tests on all of these as well for the routes and for being burst through. So each one of those has got a double cab test. So the superior ones there, well, they've gone with them already, break and a break. And the superior one there doesn't get anything. The other ones are average ones. So this is several, and I'm not even doing the multiple rights. There's actually a couple more. That's a wound. It's got two more for two rights as well. So they go. There you go. So you can see this battle actually, because of the game mechanic and the way the cabs work and how they clustered, it's all over. I mean, it's 15, it's 15 nil to the Romans because all that lot just goes sweeping back through here and the chain of cab tests will, will typically take out half of the second rank as the chariots go in the chaos and a few bases off these with burst throughs. And now the Romans are faced with the remnants here and this is when they would start forming the, uh, the the miniature wedges and driving everything forward so it really becomes uh even with no change to the rules and nothing special just if you try to do the tactics of advance everybody and try and do it it becomes mayhem and and thus you have the calamity of that whole lot being swept away by these and in this battle particularly um the romans are not going to lose a single base actually in this fight probably they, they will they will end up nearly near enough intact, which is very rare in a in a med game. And there you have it. I'm going to reduce me back to reduce that back to an attendee. to see if you got me back can you all hear me yep back on the main one excellent that's good i'm gonna actually just remove this remove myself from the meeting on the phone so i'll get rid of any sort of effects
So actually, what's interesting about it is, is, is that there are the rules, whichever system you use, are going to replicate the disaster. And it shows just what a terrible... <laughs> a, what a very good position Pylene has set up and found. So very much like Waterloo spotting the ridge at Mont Saint-Jean, uh, that was going to be a very good defensive position. He found somewhere along that Waterloo Street route to stop it, where he could tempt the, the Britons into a, an absolute trap. And that the, uh, and that the rules as set up, will actually create that kind of slaughter. It just becomes a mess. So I think of all, all of those games, this is the one where, even though outnumbered 14 to 64, it makes no difference. Quality on an hour of frontage against a mob, the rules will, will allow the, uh, the high quality to shine through. Simon, your thoughts on that one? Um, in actual fact, Lewis made a very good point on the on the talk back because he said um, it's worth rem this is a good location if it's Church Stowe, remembering that uh, there was later a Royal Ordnance uh, Depot set up there, which is what we drive past when we go to uh, Battlefield Hobbies or it's an old location anyway. But to, to 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 explain why it really is a crucial place, you've got to look at the Watford Gap. So most mm. of us know the Watford Gap simply because it's a service station on the M1. But actually, the Watford Gap is the access node between North and South England. Because you going back to the river valleys, you have the Avon going southwest and northeast as a tributary of the Severn. And you have the mm. Neen coming down from the Wash, northeast to southwest. Both of them have high ridges either side. They're, they're quite deep river valleys and they're very heavily yeah. wooded. And the, the gap between the two of them is the Watford Gap. So if you have a fortification, as an example, where you can base troops near the Watford Gap, you can shut off the north and south of England. And that's why, for example, the M1, um, Ermy Street, etc., nearby uh, later um, uh, the A1, they go through almost through this gap. So it's a really crucial area to control. The fort, um, the, the marching camp fort I showed you earlier, uh, Castle Dykes, the reason why that still exists so well is because the Normans wanted to base their own force there to close off the north and south of Britain at the Watford Gap, turn it into the mot of a mot and bailey castle. So it's a mm. really crucial location, which even adds even more importance to um, why this is an important site. And I just want to make one last point here before I hand back to you, Simon, to talk about your what-if. If anybody wants to do their own research on the Church Stowe site, the site finder is a friend of mine called John Pegg, who published a number of articles on academia where he sets out very well with lots of lovely graphics about why this is a, a crucial site. And on his Google Earth image, you can see a Crossroads Hotel. <laughs> hey. So a couple of final bits then, just to, just to bring up. I'm going to close this one down for a second and bring up a different one. So always, I always quite like to say to myself, well, just for the sake of it, if we, if we did a bit of a what if, as I said, what would happen? So I'm just going to I'm just going to run you through my uh, my what if scenario. I've not changed it enormously in the centre, so you've still got this disaster bit of <coughs> chariots. Really, just don't have the firepower there to deal with Romans on a on a hill. They're just not strong enough as troop types to cope with that, and they would have been out front because they are the symbols of nobles riding out front showing their courage. So there's a psychological trap going on that forces them into the front of the battle. But this is set up now. So what you can see now is two tribes. So that second line, which had the superiors and the two average, I put both of them through the forest. So I've taken them through the forest. And this was a really interesting view. And then I've held this back and timed it so that it was all timed a little bit more skillfully. And clearly the Britons didn't have much in the way of skill for it. And in this battle, actually, the artillery did a lot worse damage. So the first thing they did is, uh, is in, the, in the firing period, within the two shots during the charge, they broke one in the charge phase already. So they broke a chariot and, and, and caused a bit of chaos in the centre. Uh, and then we get to the period of the charges. So all these charges, all, all going in together. That's the artillery effect this time. So knocking chunks out of things. That's what took out that one. And these are charging now coming out of the forest, but into these areas where we've got barricades. And the Romans, having plenty of cards, have put these into orb. So I've now got an interesting situation where I've got all-round defence auxilia in orb with double barricades. So it's sort of representing holding the flank in a well-prepared, fortified manner. So they're not easy to knock over. So this is a, this is a little bit now what's going on as they, as they, as they go in. So as the... Uh, as the, Roman, as the Romans charge in here in the charge phase on this bit, 
these chariots get broken and they plow back. And these are the captests actually for going back through the uh, through the Roman for the Britain's second line. So the Britain's second line here is actually already crumbling in the centre. So the same thing's happening in the centre. But the Britons had a chance. And on the flank, we got some chaos. So this is the this is the um, melee phase, actually, of this particular bit. So it's it's orbs uphill versus Britain. So there's lots of factors. They've got the barricades. Uh, at first contact, they had two for the barricades, one for the hill and one for short spear. So there were four factors up the hill. So not, not a lot of damage. They suffered one wound in that phase. In the melee, they've still got one for uphill. These auxiliary are still melee experts, so they're still up everywhere. So there are red and a white here, and a yellow and a white there. But they, but they did get the two whites, which was enough to break the auxiliar, uh, even though they killed a base on each of these and broke these. So there's not much left on this flank, but the Roman edge did actually collapse. And these are the cab tests on the general who was involved in the fight. So he, uh, he suffered a, a wound for the first one, and then that dropped him down to a two-card general and was stunned by the second, so all of these discs got thrown away. So they got discarded. And as a result of that, there were a few remnants, courageous remnants from that tribe, if this boots up, that made it through. <laughs> there they are. The remainder of the nobles. No general, he's dead as well. <laughs> he's gone as well. But they made, they made it round the flank. On the other one, the Romans held. The Romans held very well. There were little bits of damage. Uh, this time there were bases lost, but the Romans lost one base and the general on one base managed to hold it together. But then, of course, how, what you get round the flank of one of these things, all hell breaks loose. So even though these guys have got no devastating charger, they're not too deep. They've still got a flank and they're still superior. So uh, so they caused quite a mess going down the line. Killed the, killed the general who retired from there and broke these. And Korea down the line, and because it's a charge phase, of won. And did it again. So the whole Roman flank collapsed on this side. And actually that ended up being a 15-10 for the Britons. But even despite that, the Britons had lost uh, seven tugs, I think, at the time. <laughs> because the front of it was a disaster. Okay? But thankfully, there was 27 to go at. They were still going. So that was a 15-10. So that would have lent to your environment where the, uh, the Britons lost. So actually what's interesting is, even on this terrain... If you can play it with a, a smart play rather than a completely impetuous play, the Britons do still have a chance, even on that terrain. And actually, the point system has the Britons 4,000 points. So if I reckon any of us as a war game are playing as a war game, if we took these two armies and did a normal terrain setup, we'd all want to be the Britons. I think the Britons will win that one 9 out of 10 with the 30% point advantage. So it is Palace's, totally agree. Gen is Palace's genius of finding this fantastic defensive position is setting it up beautifully and the inability of the Britons, which demonstrates they had no military skill, actually. This is as if the military, Bodicea had just appointed a mercenary military expert and gone, oh, hold on, guys. Don't do that. Don't do that. There's a much better way. Give us a, give us a couple of hours. Let's work the flanks for a couple of hours. You lot go that way. You lot go that way. We'll see you in two hours. Uh, it, without that kind of input, there is nothing they could do. Paralyzers have created the perfect military plus psychological trap the combination of the two it was a perfect military position beautifully set up but also a perfect psychological trap for the type of enemy he was facing because he must have known they would really struggle to do anything clever because they were all full of optimism and belief and his scouts would have told him there's a massive mob all the families are with them he would have had a pretty good idea of be saying to his troops they're going to come at us they're going to come at us this is a, this is just going to be a charge stand your ground chaps we'll be okay so I think it's a, it's a very, very interesting um, battle from the point of view of thinking about the what if and the point system. If, and actually, if we replay this accurately, I would probably put all of the generals on Bodicea's side as mediocre, actually, because I think they're all useless. I think it proves that Bodicea was useless militarily. She was, a, she was a good agent provocateur. She got the whole thing going. She got everybody fired up. But there's no military nous in this at all and give every single unit of the Britons a automatic free directly ahead move. And that would be my, my thesis on it. And then the same thing, of course, will happen, as happened with all the efforts. But there's probably no capability with all mediocre generals to even pull off anything clever. And then you'd be, then you'd be really struggling. And that would be very, very difficult. But, of course, the points would be rather a lot less for the Britons then, because they wouldn't have all those expensive generals. So the points difference would now be about 10% instead of... 
sixty percent. So it's very, very interesting, isn't it? It's a it's psychologically, the uh, the Britons thought they were going to win, and uh, the families came along to watch a great victory, and indeed they did. <laughs> it just wasn't the, it just wasn't the game they were hoping for. <laughs> Uh, they, did, they, didn't, they didn't watch that victory for very long, though. <laughs> no, no, they, they forgot to mention whose victory. <laughs> so, um, so there you have it. And I think at that point, uh, we can switch over to questions and comments, and I'll, I'll put it up into space. But I actually, I, just to say from my side, when Simon mentioned this one, for the little I knew of it, I thought, oh, it's not going to be very interesting. That's a done deal. But actually... The more I've got involved in it and thought about it, the more interesting it gets, actually. Militarily, it's very, very interesting. And in rules, it's very interesting because the rules are standard. The way I've set them up with the good generals recreate the same thing. And, it, and even with all of those discs, it's not easy to do anything clever because you've got too many troops. You know, If you're committed to try and advance with them, you're, you're stuck. You don't have enough flexibility to do anything clever. Um, and if, if you add to that, of course, they thought they were going to win and they thought their chariots were rather good and underestimated the Romans, and probably hadn't met artillery much at that time, I guess, Sam, because they were, only if Hispana had a few with them, they'd have a few scorpions, but they wouldn't have met anything like what they approached here. They did hit the start of the Gladiator to movie Unleash Hell moment, where a whole raft of artillery opened fire on them, and they wouldn't have been expecting that at all. So, well, it's worth reflecting that the... the um... The the the, the Iceni, the Catalan, in the Trilobantes, all um, signed the peace deal in AD forty three. So from that point onwards, there'd have been no conflict with the Romans anyway. Mm. For them, so you're talking about um, seventeen years where there'd been no conflict, apart from one event in around AD, I think it's about AD fifty, when the then British governor, I think it was Balanus, had to go and put down an insurrection. Within some of the Iceni, so it's often talked about as the first Iceni insurrection, as part of his gradual disarming process of the British tribes who'd submitted to Rome or who were client states. So, the, so, okay. so basically, they, apart from that one event, so to take out from that, number one, they were partially disarmed anyway, and number two, uh, from that point, so for 10 years, there'd been no conflict with Rome. Yeah, so they must have felt like the people who first experienced the machine gun. Gatling gun. Yeah, first people who hit the Gatling gun. But what the hell is yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and didn't know what it was. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, oh, that's, that's, oh, never mind. <laughs> okay, uh, let me put this into question mode. Comments and questions, please just retype if you had something very uh, interesting earlier. There were one or two that came up, but I have to scroll back an awful long way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off things that are more uh, more frequent. Let's see what, what we've got going. I, I mean, think Richard's done a very good job answering some for us, actually. And he's answered a lot of them, yeah. See, so there's a, there's a few comments that I'll put on rather than questions for the time until some part. There's a lot of comments that maybe the Roman, maybe they could have held back and raided up and down and completely cut off all the Roman supplies. Uh, they 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 were incapable of doing it, probably. I think the challenge that she would have had with all armies of that era, especially the barbarian-type armies, is once you've got an army together, it has to fight. Because you're rich, so, because you, your two choices are fight or run out of water and disband, at which point all of the power you've built into your rebellion has disappeared and dissipated. So it, the inclination is, is, is to fight. And I think it would be very difficult to actually switch a whole mass like that into Right, let's do a raiding strategy for a year and wear these Romans down. Uh, Simon, go. Sure. Completely agree. There's, I, I think there's no way on earth Booty could have done anything other than what she did. I think she very, very specifically went for a meeting engagement. She knew she'd got to, she got this one shot, this is it. And she knew the jeopardy if she lost. Hmm. So she went for it. And she, I, I don't think, especially given the size of the force, she just not got the command and control and probably not the, what we would in wargaming terms call the troop types to to um, to follow that kind of strategy. So totally agree with you. Yeah. And I think there's an interesting comment from Richard here. I'm just going to put, of course, when you talk about 17 years of peace, that means they've got a whole generation who've never really fought. So you've got the Roman experts and actually – Probably my setup, where the vast majority of warriors defined as poor, is actually quite quite true. Given that very few of them would have actually had any experience of actual 
been bloodied in a battle of, of any form and any experience other than what had happened very, very recently. So um, uh, the youth of that army was, was green, it was fresh. Question here from Phil Nash over in, the, uh, uh, over in Thailand. Is there any idea of the weather on the day? Is there anything in the record? Well, that's it. There isn't, so the primary sources don't talk about the weather, but when the Romans fought other battles, the primary sources, if the weather was a factor, do talk about it. So, for example, the Severan incursions into Scotland, uh, Dio and Herodian uh, talk about there being horrendous weather for the entire two-year campaigning period. So I think here, if weather had been a factor, um, it, 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 it would have been mentioned. So I'd say no. And it's also worth pointing out as well, this is probably quite late in the campaigning season because the primary sources do talk about the fact that as an outcome of this battle, the harvests in the north of Norfolk went to rot because there was no one left to actually gather the harvest. So it's probably mm. late August, early September. Yeah, okay. I'm from Chris here. Uh, can you see any possibility that the Britons could have pursued a different strategy than a, than a frontal I, I think in practice, no. I think in, in terms of what they were um, and how they were operating as a, as a huge rebellion on the attack, I don't think so. I think that scenario that I did as a what if is kind of assuming a, a, a mercenary, more military expert managed to get some influence and somehow they managed to control the enthusiasm they had. Clearly, after, uh, after wiping out... I mean, you've got to imagine the situation they're in that Simon's described. Okay, they, they set off with a rebellion, a bit like Spartacus. They get going. They gather loads of people to their cause. They go and burn down the leading Roman place in Britain, trash it totally. They go on and trash a fair chunk of, uh, uh, of London. They defeat badly and, and kill off the majority of a legendary legion. Um, and by now, they've got an army the size, a size which they cannot believe on the move. So whoever is in the lead of that at that moment is going to be blessed with a huge amount of self-confidence. And to be fair, that if, if Paulinus has set his troops up in a different way, not find a great hill to defend and not find a valley to sit in, imagine he just set up on a hill with flanks that were more open. He would have been, even with that hill, probably in real trouble because the, the chariot, says a classic strategy, would ride forward, throw javelins and then ride off to the sides and then allow a charge. There's, there's nowhere to go. There's no, the problem with this one is their classic strategy, there's nowhere to go at the sides. The chariots are stuck. The only way is into the Romans or back through their own troops. So it, it really is, to me, the brilliance of, how, of the position he found that, that preys on that mentality that they had to go and they had to leave and the other problem is the chariots of course are the are the sort of noble leaders so they're the ones trying to display the courage so to also have a clever strategy where you go oh you know in the war games book reading it uphill against romans i figure actually my chariots probably are not that good i'll save the tuggers and i'll keep them at the back for later as a reserve well we could try and do that if we want to in a game but for actual real leader in reality where they are the ones that provide the courage for the troops following them you can't you can't do it. You know. It's also worth emphasizing there again, Simon, as well, the, the, the beauty of the position which Paulinus positioned his troops because you have the bowl-shaped valley with a funnel at the front. The funnel itself is going to present problems for the Britons deploying their, their troops onto the battlefield. To go back to my earlier points, Boudicca and the British leadership didn't have a, a didn't have an option not to engage here because by not engaging, they'd have the Ro a professional Roman army in their rear, cutting them off from their own homelands. And they are not a professional fighting force. They know at some stage they've got to go and get their harvest. That would have been front and centre in the minds of these part-time warriors. And then if you look at the horseshoe, the bowl-shaped the bowl valley with the Avon and, and the, the, the Neen, I want to overemphasize the nature of the 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 the, the riverine wood, woodland on their banks because this is mm. very very dense woodland. It's willows and things like that. And remember again, this had been a fighting frontier ten years earlier, so you probably find that any of the local farming land was still only just coming under the plough again. So this would have been very dense terrain, which probably only Roman sappers would have been able to get away through. So I don't think the Britons, even given your scenario, the what if, I really hard. don't think they would have been, it'd been very, very, very hard for them. So, and, and, and then again, we have field defences being built and marching camps on the flanks. If you want an analogy of somebody fighting this battle who is not on his A game, it's the British leader fighting the battle at Isloan Duana, which is a very similar kind of battle with an overwhelming mm. force fighting against a much more modern force deployed on a hillside. The British leader there, I can't remember his name, clearly was on his A game, mm. but Paul Linus was. 
Chelmsford's Collins, yeah. It was it was difficult, wasn't it? I agree. So uh, let's just, a couple of other comments. This is another good point for Phil Nash, I think, going back to the weather. He asked the weather question. It's another reason why they had to fight, of course. If it was in September, you've got winter season coming. So keeping an army together through that, absolutely impossible. Even worse, <laughs> no, really impossible. So they had no choice. Um, would another Roman ge general do as good a job as Polina? I think Polina clearly was a talented, talented or better general. I mean, I think it's a fantastic piece of military work that he pulled off, even without the reinforcement of that second legion, which he would have been hoping would have been marching to his assistance. He managed to pull this off. So um, I think on average, no. I think on average, Roman generals are not actually that great, actually. The, uh, but uh, the above average ones, yes. All the famous ones of history, take, take, a, take, a, take a Scipio or an Augustus or a Caesar or a Pompey. I think they'd have done a very similar high quality job, yes. You could take, take a view about how good Paulinus was by his fate after the battle. So, so we'll use another analogy and come back to him. You remember Agricola as the only Roman military leader when he was the governor of Britain who could have claimed at all to have conquered the whole island of Britain uh, very, for a very short period and then sent the regional fleet around to, circ uh, to, to, to circumnavigate Britain. And then Domitian builds a monumental arch in Richmond to celebrate the event. So he's probably the finest of the governor-level military leaders in British history uh, in Roman Britain. And yet, uh, when he goes back to Rome, he gets a sort of a fairly minimal triumph, if that, gets a statue built of, built of him, and that's it. Because clearly, he's been so successful, he's almost putting to shame the emperor. The same happens with Paulinus. <laughs> Right. Okay. So Paul. So Paul. So remember the procurator, the the the, yes. the, the chancellor is already is in Gaul, is legged it. So Nero puts one of his mates in charge as the um, new procurator, and Nero's mate tells Nero that actually Paulinus is actually being too aggressive in his retribution against the British, and therefore you can imagine the shepherds cr coming off camera. And suddenly Paulinus <laughs> is yanked back to Rome and he's replaced by another placeman of Nero. And he gets nothing. He, he gets nothing. He gets nothing. There is a there is a guy, Suetonius Paulinus, who 10 years later is a consul in Rome. But we don't know if that was another one or Paulinus's son. But certainly Paulinus does not get the credit for this victory. And I think probably if you were to look at in, in our terms at uh, the three key um uh, military leaders in the first century in Britain, you'd have Plautius with the AD 43 invasion, Paulinus defeating Boudicca and Agricola. You'd probably have Agricola as a legendary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and you could make a case that Paulinus, more because of his logistical skills than his fighting skills, we have no evidence of him fighting on the front mm. line, could also be legendary because of the site of the battlefield and the way he equipped his army. Mm. Uh, uh, Plautius probably talented. Everybody else may be competent. Which is which is interesting because if you're all thinking rule terms, as you played a lot, what did the Roman, what did Paulinus really do here in Meg terms? He won a PBS battle. He won the pre-battle strategy completely. Uh, very good point. Did. Really good. Really good point. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's really what's going on. That's an interesting question, and I have no idea the answer. I would be guessing the answer would be no because <laughs> they're in a rush. But it's a good question. Is there evidence? Did they have any military intel at all, the Britons, to know about the enemy, where they were, locations, or were they just rushing more or less in the direction where they heard there be Romans? Uh, I think they probably did actually, because uh, if you read the primary sources, remember the Roman mi military formations in enemy territory at the end of every day's march, build a marching camp. So you'd assume that the area that Paulinus had moved through to get to Wales was now not enemy territory because it had been conquered. This is north of the northwest of the Fosway frontier. However, we do know from the sources that Paulinus was building marching camps as he came down from Anglesey towards High Cross and then probably, in my opinion, towards Church Stow. So he was now thinking that the previously conquered territory was now not conquered. It was now unsafe not to have his troops in a marching camp at night. So therefore, you'll probably find that the native Britons uh, are, are around the areas he was marching through, certainly in Northamptonshire and Leicestershire, were giving intelligence to uh, people who could get it to Boudicca. Um, uh, not to the same level of intelligence as you would have going, that the Romans would have, because remember, the Romans have got their ally of cavalry scouting, etc. Mm. But um, I think the Romans w were certainly fearful of the location they found themselves in, which is again why Paulinus was such a genius to choose the site. Yeah. 
Fine question, Steve. Clark. It obviously reduced chariot movement, Paulina, not to do Caltrops effectively out of the freeze. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give my, I don't know if, A, we don't know if they had any. I mean, that depends what they had in the equipment. But I think given he set up his position, I think he was trying to draw them onto his artillery. So I think the last thing he really wanted to do was slow him down. He wanted them to come forward into range and, and have the confidence to play forward on his defensive position. So I don't think he would have cared. I think he's, I think he, Simpson, he would have had range markers out for the, uh, for the main catapults, the Onigas that he'd, he'd managed to bring out of the supply system. It, they'd have had some range markers down for the heavy ballistas and for the scorpions and for the launch of javelins. And they just wanted to draw them all onto the, fa- the field of fire down the, down the corridor. So slowing them down or doing anything that would stop them moving forward probably wasn't in his mind, I suspect. Another, another good analogy there, actually, Simon, thinking about it, it's probably Omdurman, where you have the Romans with all this elite technology of the day. And mm. don't underestimate the power of the volleys of the, um, the Lancia from the auxiliaries and the slings being used by the auxiliaries, mm. if they had any there, and any auxiliary bowmen. But certainly the two volleys of pillar, the, the, the lighter pillar, as the enemy just break into their final charge. And then just before the impacts as the enemy formations are breaking up, you get hammered by, say, 6,000 heavy pillar. Most of these British troops, they may have had a shield, but that's it. You know, yes. And even if they've got a shield, that heavy pillar at point blank range is going to go through it. So you mm. can imagine the front ranks. There's only sort of a, a minimal number of Britons actually reaching the Romans before uh, um, Paul Linus forms the, the Coenus Swineshead formations and then the butchery takes place. It's an almost it's a, almost a perfect battle, he thought. Mm. Which is actually funny. That's exactly what happens in my main game. They actually barely make contact. And then with the Romans, you have bands and finish them off. In the game because it, you've caused so much chaos and in the in the bits you sent me i think one of the interesting things is just the 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 wrecked chariots and horses dragging bits of chariots all over the place fleeing back through their own trucks the artillery just caused mayhem there were there were individual horses dragging chariots back through their own troops and, and so they clearly made one hell of a mess i mean to be a uh, a fly on a tree and have watched it must have been quite something i mean it was, it was I, I, i've actually stood if, if, the, if the battle site is Church Stowe, I mean, I've been there twice. I've actually stood on top of the hill where the British families would have been looking at the battle. So I've seen the whole horizon where you can imagine the legions arrayed. But then I've stood at the bottom in the funnel. And I estimate that funnel is probably the range of the heavier ballista. So mm. even as they arrive on the battlefield, they're, being, they're, they're under fire. And then in, remember, it's a horseshoe valley. So they're not only under fire. Use another, use another uh, analogy. Um, uh, charge of the light brigade for example uh, they're being enfiladed as well so yeah. it's a killing field even before they arrive there and I tell you now if you stand there in that funnel the hairs on the back of your neck stand up I bet just a question from me yeah, pick up, pick up there. Um, is, is there yet any archaeological process going on with the sensor systems the ultrasounds to try and find the evidence of the battle in that area because we would imagine there must be all sorts of bits of chariots and weapons and stuff buried under the ground there where the battle occurred uh it's a very good question simon well i've been uh, to, to date it's been metal detecting so mm-hmm. I've, I've come in as a sort of an organizer of the 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 investigation and the first thing we're going to do is to do a geophys survey of the whole site that will give us hot spots and then that will guide us on to um uh more metal detecting field walking and uh ultimately excavations I, I've been in the woodland on either side of the, the horseshoe, and in there, there is certainly worked sto- monumental stone, which has been removed by local farmers, which is almost certainly from a battle monument. Mm. Uh, I've got one piece at the moment that we're investigating chemically. Uh, I've also found field walking, what looks like it could be part of the part of a, 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 a cavalry hasta uh, spearhead but without the tip so that's been uh, x- x-rayed at the moment the issue you've got there though which is why you need a proper investigation is in the bottom of the valley where most of the casualties would have taken place and the burials will be you've got nearly two thousand years of hill wash there so the archaeology yeah. is down below two meters of hill wash so it's almost below where a de- metal detector can operate which is why we need the geophys yeah um uh, but but also um it will only be through investigating these hotspots that the geophysicists will find that we'll actually find the proper archaeology. What we do find, though, in the, the field walking and all the fields around is there's lots of smashed up bits of Roman tile, uh, which is a key tell that there was Roman building taking place. There's no record there was a Roman settlement here at all. So almost certainly 
if this is the site that these will be from battlefield monuments and finally if you go into the, the church at church stowe that's built overlooking the funnel uh, of the battlefield site so it's looking over the old whole site towards the roman deployment and in the uh, in the part of and also that's built on a man-made platform the church uh, yard and if if you look at the church tower, the, the 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 part that faces towards the battlefield, in the middle of it, there's a weathered sandstone block, which looks almost certainly as though it was part of a battlefield monument because it has what looks like a column of victory with an eagle with spread wings on the top, which has got a snake in its mouth, which is a key Roman uh, image in inscriptions and sculpture for a victory monument. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. One from Richard. If Boudicca had won, would the Romans have abandoned Britain? And if they did, could they have returned? Uh, it's a fantastic question. I've always said, I think, I always start my presentations on Roman Britain by saying that even after this, when the Romans doubled down on the province and they turned the, they turned the capital to London, etc., and they recommit to it, even then it's always the wild west of the Roman Empire because the far north is never conquered. It's always a place of trouble. Uh, I think Nero, given his nature, would have probably abandoned the province if Boudicca had won. And the primary sources say he considered it even after Paul Linus had won. So the question immediately is yes, would they have come back? That's a different matter because the Romans had to have the political will in the first place to conquer Britain. Claudius, uh, it was a Hail Mary for Claudius when, when he committed, simply because he knew that he needed a major win to secure himself as the most unlikely of um, emperors. And other emperors may not have tried. So maybe not. Maybe not. Hmm. Okay, I've got a couple of other. Good, so this, this is a cracker because I've actually tried this. Is it possible to get play, play the pre-game system in Meg so successfully that battlefield this beneficial defenders this type of battlefield pretty much senior as senior as we actually it's a very that's a really interesting question that you asked that Andrew and, and I've forgotten to mention it. Um, I, the the bottom line answer is yes because uh, I've I've tried it a couple of times when I came to the idea that actually it probably was a talented Roman general and actually all the other guys all the all the Britons should be mediocre and at that point you've got a mass of PBS cards compared to the Britons. So if you play it out that way uh, and, and choose your terrain, usually you'll get the choice of what terrain to play in. And you just put down to have enough terrain and then you put down uh, wooded hills for the optionals and, and hills and move them around. And actually, I, I got things quite close to it, actually. So yeah, you can. But it's, it's all, that's all to do with probably what the reality was, which is from a PBS perspective, a talent, Paul, Paul Anus, as a as a general facing mediocre instinctives on the other side, and and that probably is well, that's probably something like seven against three in PBS cards. Just guessing off the top of my head, somebody can probably work it out who's offline. But it's a huge difference. So so um, when the Britons are playing, they're going to have to play two compulsory blacks. So Paulinus is going to get to put the battle in whichever square he wants the battle to be, and he's uh, he, he can then shunt the terrain around and he's the one who wants the valleys and the hill and it won't mind quite where it is as long as you can find a, a really good hill for them to attack on and some protected flanks you'll be pretty well off so um no it, i mean scenario specific in the sense that the features are slightly too big for normal factor so it wouldn't come out quite like that but yes you can get actually pretty close to it but uh, have a go give it a try set up a table and imagine yourself a polinus with seven pbs cards and talented so you're uh, you're you're rolling a yellow and you're rolling it against a, um, a mediocre general to start with, so they're rolling a white. So you're going to get the choice to invade or defend. Right? You'll, you'll, you'll be able to choose which of the territory types you want to be in, probably, because with the first card, you, you, you've got the advantage there because you've only got three to play with, and you'll be able to force the battle wherever you like on the map. So I think yes is the bottom line answer to that. There's a little bit of aftermath stuff. There's two types of these questions. There's... Uh, uh, there's would, they, would the Romans have buried the British dead? Uh, were the bodies burnt afterwards or buried? So similar sort of theme of the question. What did the, what did the Romans do to the dead bodies of those they'd uh, slaughtered? You, you would usually uh, dig huge burial pits and just bury them, get them quickly out of the way. It's, it's, it, and you, uh, it, it's counterintuitively, 
it seems historically it was easier after a major conflict like this with huge amounts of dead to actually bury the bodies in mass pits rather than set them on fire. Right. Okay. And they do that pretty quickly because presumably they'd have disease worries. Is the, is the so it's exactly, exactly right. It's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as Rich just reminded me, uh, wouldn't there be much metal left after the battle? Actually, that's that's true. Actually, in ancient battles, there's only metal in the battles where the winners picked it up and ran off with it. It was too <laughs> it's too valuable to be left around. But there'd be a few there'd be a few a, a few remnants. There'd be more bones probably than uh, than metal. Um, what have we got here? Was the... uh, Tommy was the professional command system the reason the Romans won the Battle of Watling Street? Well, fundamentally, I'd say I, I'd say largely speaking. Yes, with a high quality commander, because it means they win the PBS if you play it openly, set themselves up a good defensive position. Um, the Britons are the ones who are actually desperate to win. Um, and then actually in the battles, I thought the fact they can store red and yellows when it did get sweaty and he can hand them out wherever he wanted. I see what kept the army going once when it got under a bit of pressure. They, they just keep recovering off runes and sorting things out when they get in trouble. So I think it's a big part of it. Yes. In the, in the way the game system plays. I think that's pretty much covered everything because the rest is more comments around it being fish in a barrel and uh, such things, which certainly is true. So I'll go bring us back on, on screen for a second. There we go. It's been a lot of fun. I'm just going to say a couple of quick things for the future by loading up my master one again. A couple of things to finish just to tell you a bit about the future. Just in case you hadn't noticed, as it happens, out last week and looking very beautiful, uh, the new Morton Glory and Pacto packs for the Gauls and the early Imploder Romans. The Gallic one, there are going to be extension pouches to them. So there's a chariot, a slinger and a light horse extension pack which can turn that Gallic army into something you can play the ancient Britons with. And the early Imperial Romans, the Corvus Belly ones, they do look, they look fabulous, actually. They're really looking good. So uh, if you want to build armies for this game, no better place to start than there and uh, out very soon because I know he spent a lot of time proofreading it last week because he couldn't get this pack done until Friday so he must have been busy uh, <laughs> is, is Romans at War which is a tabletop whopper which I'm looking forward to getting my copy of in, in due course and sticking on our coffee table and I think even Magdalene my wife will enjoy brazing that to have a look at it, it sounds, sounds fantastic it's got a whole load of interesting stuff in it and just to, uh, just to talk about some events coming up next so we're going to do these monthly. So there you go. You've got your Watling Street one done. Uh, the next one we're going to do is Ruspina, which is one of my all-time favorite battles to look at. And I've now rebuilt a Numidian army big enough to do it. So I'm going to do that in Maximus. So uh, it's, it's Caesar on a foraging trip in Numidia, getting caught by Pompeian Numidians in the open on a plane and getting surrounded and having to fight their way out. So it's a really, really interesting battle to refight using the system. Um, also on the list to do, they, we might change these a bit in the order because I threw these in for a previous presentation without discussing these fully with Simon, but four certainly I think they're worth us doing on the list. A couple more Roman ones, Carai with the Parthians, and it's a very interesting one to refight under the system. And, uh, and Farsalus from the Roman Civil War is also an interesting one for us to do at some point. And then we'll expand beyond the classic Roman era. Certainly two in out we talked about was Manzikert and Hidaspes. So keep Keep looking at what we're going to do. If you've enjoyed today, put all stuff out to your friends on social media. There's another one at 4 p.m. UK time today. Anybody can join. They just need to send me an email address, and I'll add them as a, as a, as a late addition. So spread the news if you've enjoyed it. Last thing for those of you as players, Global Megathon we've set up for August the 29th. Let's see how many people we can play in little events around the world. I know it's not easy with COVID. Some of them might prove difficult. I think Belgium might now have a problem and have to go remote if they do anything. I know Phil in Thailand is doing one which is more remote. Um, we've got ours set up in Cape Town, and I've circulated that a fair, fair bit and put that on the web. There's two already confirmed in the UK. There's a Ray Fest and a Peak Fest going on. So there's a North and South at the moment. There may end up being more. Olivier is trying to set one up in France. Costas is pretty certain they'll have one in Greece. And the Australians are looking at doing one. There's one already in Portland, USA, being set up as a face-to-face. -face. And we've got Poland has come on board and is going to be uh, playing on that day. The more, the merrier. So, again, encourage your friends. Very simple uh, uh, rules. The only thing you need to have is four to six players playing. And each player has got a score 
an out of 50 you score against three different opponents and you can play it on the 30th if you want it's another 29th any any system you like we're doing we're doing pacto here in 50 mil use whichever version you want to do any theme you like you can have it themed or you can have it entirely open we're going entirely entirely open the only important thing is three three scores in and keep yourself safe and that's that's about it oh oh there we go there we go and that's it i think and nothing more from me so i think at that point i will say au revoir it's been a good fight from me and it's a good fight from him see you again soon bye everybody bye. have a good day bye <laughs>